The President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, is one of the greatest success stories in the history of global health. What lessons can PEPFAR teach us about building state capacity, about getting the bureaucracy to work efficiently, about nonpartisan governments? Dr. Mark Dybul is the CEO of Renovaro Biosciences and the executive chair of Purpose Life Sciences, and he's also the former executive director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, as well as the former U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator in charge of PEPFAR. He joins our show to talk about the history of the PEPFAR program, how to make the bureaucracy work, and why we need to put aside partisan fights to reauthorize this program. As always, thank you so much for listening. We appreciate all of you. And if you want to give us a like, a subscribe, a recommendation, all of that is very welcome. If you want to support the podcast further, you can do so on our Patreon at patreon.com slash new liberal podcast. You can also support us by becoming a member of the Center for New Liberalism at cnliberalism.org slash become a member. Thank you so much and enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the New Liberal Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and joining us this episode is Mark Dybul. Mark, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. So you've worn a lot of hats in your career. You've, you've been CEO, you've been professor, you've been at many different uh, positions with, within the, the nonprofit medical world and the U.S. government administrations. But I want to start just by talking about how you got into all this, because I think it's a very interesting potential story for someone who, you know, just started out as a doctor, as someone who did internal medicine and then started studying infectious diseases to working in the government and working in kind of big nonprofit, the world where your job is as a planner, not as a doctor, really. Yeah. How did you make the transition from, you know, going to med school, wanting to be a doctor into wanting to be a policymaker and wanting to be a, a bureaucrat, as scary as that word is, yeah. wanting to be someone who helps control big decisions. How did that start for you? Bureaucrat's uh, the right word. I often define myself that way. And it is probably useful to go back a little bit before that because I had zero interest in medicine or science and went into medicine and science because of the HIV pandemic in Africa. I was actually trying to decide between a doctoral degree in philosophy, theology, and considering a little bit English because I love poetry. When I read a front page news story about AIDS in Africa in the mid-80s, I guess it would have been, and uh, just grabbed a hold of me and ended up changing my career path, went to medical school. And at that point, you know, people were just dying. Um, it's all we could do for people is watch them die and give them bad drugs that were toxic for them. And so if, fr from the very beginning then, like before you had even decided to go to med school, this was very much not, not you went, you became a doctor and then you got interested in AIDS. It's you got interested in AIDS, HIV, and then because of that, you became a doctor. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely would not have been a doctor otherwise. <laughs> I had zero interest. Um, and. Uh, so when all my friends in medical school were trying to decide what, what they were going to do, it was pretty easy for me. Um, same in residency when people were trying to decide what subspecialty. It was, I, I already knew. Um, so, you know, at that point, again, all you could do is watch people die. And uh, that was not something I hoped to do. So I wanted to go into research to contribute whatever I could um, beyond uh, just being a clinician. And the, my, the chair of medicine where I went to, uh, did my residency, Arthur Rubenstein, who's kind of a legend, um, knew Tony Fauci and told me I should go work with him. He, I didn't want to, actually. I wanted to go to Stanford <laughs> and was offered a fellowship there, but um, met Tony and people in his lab and realized that NIH is the place to be and Tony was the person to be with. So I uh, did my fellowship there and... Um, you know, from day one at NIH, when you come, you come accepted into a lab. So I came accepted into Tony's lab, did my f first year of clinical, and then 
went on to st- do research with Tony. We were doing a, a lot of things. I ended up running a section of his lab, um, which is rather large. Actually, my first supervisor was Drew Weissman, who just won the Nobel Prize. Is, isn't it so funny how you can look back and, and at things like, you know, I was working with Tony Fauci, and this would have been like the late 80s, early 90s, early 90s probably for yeah. you. And like, yeah. we're still talking about, uh, you know, the great Tony Fauci three decades later. <laughs> He's still, yeah. he's, you know, only very recently did he kind of step out of the spotlight, but he's he's been in the middle of it all this whole time. He has, and we'll still be talking about him in two decades because he'll still be working, I'm sure. Um, and we were doing work on immunology, virology, but clinically based. So um, we we were work, working on reducing the amount of therapy people would need, mostly focused on Africa because that's where my real interest was from the beginning to see if there were a way to reduce the amount of of antivirals people needed to take so that you could reduce the cost and toxicity related to it. Um, At that point, um, Tony Fauci, or George Bush, decided he wanted to do something huge on HIV AIDS. And they decided before coming into the administration. It wasn't wasn't because of the mythology that you hear about faith-based leaders whispering in his ear or Tony advocating, which of course he did, but they came in wanting to do something large on HIV AIDS, as many presidents do. Uh, they turned to Tony. Tony and I were doing work in Africa already, including a, a clinical trial. Because of that, I was privileged to see people in communities at Joint Clinical Research Center. They had established a program with outposts run by nurses delivering antiretroviral therapy to the few people who could afford it, uh, which was a very small number at the time. And then the U.S. CDC was partnering with an organization called TASA, a community-based organization that was started initially to just uh, accompany people as they were dying and to, and to talk about prevention or teach prevention. Uh, but they were piloting using motor scooters to deliver antiretroviral therapy to people's homes under the theory that people, most people can walk a day uh, and sit around for eight hours uh, to go to clinic. And so I saw both of those, and we knew about the potential for that. And so, um, first of all, we came up working with a small group in the White House, something called the Prevention of Mother and Child Initiative, which was announced in 2022, the summer of 2022. And we thought we were done. It was a $500 million five-year initiative to reduce mother-child transmission by getting the varipine. And mm-hmm. we thought that was amazing because people were spending almost nothing on anti, um, any sort of treatment in Africa, in fact, none. And, and that's, kind of the, that's kind of the origin of, of all this. But before, yes. before we do get into kind of the nuts and bolts, because I can tell you're yeah. really eager to get into like the origin story here, essentially. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd love to linger just a second on, on the idea of kind of going into medicine with the idea immediately that like, I want to, you know, not just be a doctor, I want to be doing policy as a doctor. Do you think that more people should be doing that? And and I'll, I'll make this maybe a two layer question. It, should more doctors be doing that? Should more doctors be, you know, going and becoming a doctor, but with an aim towards like, I want to help the government pursue medicine more effectively, and then maybe even other professions? You know, it, do you think that bureaucrat is an underrated career choice? Well, I should be clear that becoming a bureaucrat or policymaker was not my intention. My intention was to become a researcher um, in HIV. And that I was very happy. NIH is a phenomenal place. Tony's lab is the best place you can be. So my intention was to go into research because uh, clinically all we could do is watch people die. I had no interest in policymaking at the time. Tony did bring me in to uh, be the executive secretary of the guidelines panel for antiretroviral therapy for adults and adolescents in the U.S. So I got this, and into his front office for some other work on policy. But my my heart and my time was spent in the laboratory uh, and doing clinical trials. Uh, it wasn't until the mother and child initiative and then PEPFAR that I became interested in, more interested in policy. Um, and it wasn't easy to do because being a researcher at NIH is a pretty spectacular life. But it was clear to me and that the potential to have impact was greater 
much greater if you entered the policy realm than than if you just remained a researcher. I do think it, people should be thinking about such things. And more and more I do hear, I do get contacted from people who finish their residency and are more interested in policymaking or people who get PhDs and decide that they want to be more influential in policy. But policy, I always tell people, policy is a massive area. You know, there aren't PEPFARs popping up every day. So your day-to-day work is very different. But, I, you know, when I do meet doctors who are policymakers on the Hill, for example, on Capitol Hill or within the administration, you have a lot more say if you have an MD and you went through it. I don't know what the numbers are, but I have seen an increase in people who go to medical school and don't do their residency, planning to just use medical school and their MD as an entry point to policymaking. To be honest, I think you should go through your residency uh, because you're, you, you don't really know medicine until you, do, until you actually do medicine. Medical school doesn't teach you medicine and doesn't teach you what you would need to know to be a, 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 the best possible policymaker. But yes, I would like to see people with more professions entering government or public service uh, because the, it is a very fulfilling life. You might go to bed tired, but you're never going to go to bed wondering if you're doing something meaningful. It's something I think about a lot in terms of, you know, it, bureaucracy is not always the most exciting thing, but, you know, it, I think that the returns to your effort there can be very, very high across a number of fields, whether you're an economist, a doctor, uh, even, you know, uh, weirder things, like if you're trained in history or literature or something, I think there's there's a real space there for a lot of people to make a difference. It's just, it's not always obvious to people that that's true. It's not always the sexiest thing to do, but it's something that that I like to think about. And, and certainly I think that there's a lot of ways to change the world that way. There, there absolutely is. And I, I'm worried that whatever interest there was in that is really starting to trail off, at least in the U.S. and, and Europe, with decrease in trust in government, um, which is un- very unfortunate. I see far more energy around it in Africa uh, and the desire to make change. I, I think there's something interesting there in terms of state capacity. And we'll, I think we'll get into this later. We don't have to jump into it right now. But there, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people who see the purpose of the state right now, or uh, not in that they want it to be this way, but that they observe it. The purpose of the state is to stop things from happening, to slow things down. We've got to have a bunch of meetings before we can build that housing project. We've got right. to, you know, there's a bunch of environmental reviews to do before we can ever build high, high speed rail. There's kind of this grand system of just hundreds of veto points for any major project. And that seems to be what government does, as opposed to like a positive vision of Let's build things. Let's create things. The government can be a force that drives things forward rather than holds them back. I, to me, that is part of the reason that people have fallen out of love with the idea of like, I don't want to work for the government because who wants to be the bureaucrat who just stops right. things all day? Right. And also the mythology you know, that's being created um, by tech and other giants that their lives aren't entirely dependent on investments by the U.S. government. You know, every penny... <laughs> that these tech people made uh, relies on two things. One, the massive investments the U.S. government made in technology uh, that allowed for computers to even be created. Uh, and then secondly, the massive government contracts that their lives depend on. And yet they run around preaching anti-government. You know, government doesn't know what it's doing when every penny they have comes from the U.S. government uh, or another government entity. So it's very unfortunate that we have people who have basically sucked at the teat of the government their entire lives, then saying how terrible the government is. We're definitely going to get back into state capacity in a later part of this conversation, but let's jump into kind of the beginning of how PEPFAR got started. And we may need to kind of, for people who are not intimately familiar with it already, because some people who listen to this podcast will already be, you know, they're big nerds. Some of them will already know, but some of them may not. Let's talk about, you know, you joining kind of the, the George Bush admi- administration and, and you kind of being placed there and, and Bush coming in and realizing that, hey, there's this, you know, he wants to do something big on AIDS. What was PEPFAR? How was it originally conceived and how did it get started for people who are not just familiar with any of this at all? Yeah, so the or- original conception was, uh, was the president. He wanted to do something big on HIV AIDS, and 
he and Condi, uh, uh, Condi Rice have spoken about this. Mike Gerson did before, unfortunately he died. Um, uh, Josh Bolton has somewhat. And it's clear that that's the case because they created the uh, high level task force with Secretaries Powell, uh, Colin Powell at State, and Tommy Thompson at, at Health and Human Services on global HIV AIDS almost as soon as they came into office. And then, you know, in the summer of 2021, his first year in office, so a couple months in, they announced the first gift to the Global Fund, which I became executive director of, on later, of later. Um, but it had been in existence on paper uh, for a year and a half, but no one had given any money to it. So the first gift came from George W. Bush with Kofi Annan and President Obasanjo of Nigeria standing behind him in the Rose Garden. Um, so it was clear, you know, in their first months, they were already taking action, but it wasn't clear where they were going to go beyond uh, the global fund. And so Josh Bolton was charged by the president of putting a small group together. And the, a couple of instructions that came from the president were that it be done in secret, um, because if you do involve all government processes, which you know, need for regular day-to-day -day management, but to do bold things, you need to do them with a small group to come up with the idea and then carry it forward. Um, and the second was, don't come back and tell me how much money you want. And the reason for that is that's how we, the U.S. government and every development agency used to function. You would ask for money and then you would do things with it. Um, his view was the other way around. Tell me what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and then I'll find the money. But don't tell me how much money you need. Um, so the first thing uh, happened is Tony Fauci and, and Tommy Thompson uh, led a group to Africa um, uh, in 20, early 2022 uh, or late 2021, I don't remember. And they came back and, you know, it's you get very emotional when you see babies infected with HIV and, you know, they and their mother are going to die. And NIH had just funded some studies that showed a single dose of nevirapine would reduce the transmission from mothers t to children by 50% with a single dose. And that seemed very doable. Um, at the same time, you know, in the United States, we were treating people who had full HIV, not just transmitting to the child, with antiretroviral therapy that was keeping them alive too, not just preventing the child from getting infected. But so we they came back and said, we should do this. Tony and I worked with Health and Human Services and the White House, a very small group, to generate um, what became the Prevention of Mother and Child HIV Initiative, which President Bush announced in the Rose Garden in June of 2002. And Tony and I thought we were done. We thought it was great. $500 million, 50, uh, reduction of transmission of 50% in 14 countries and the Caribbean, where two-thirds of the infections were occurring, HIV, new HIV infections were occurring. And I, we thought we were going back to our lives at NIH. I certainly did. Um, but a, after the announcement, Josh Bolton, who was the uh, deputy chief of staff at the time, pulled Tony aside and said, you know, the president said this is a great start, but think big. Uh, and Tony called me on his way back to the office and I was waiting in his office when he got there, and because of our experience there and knowing about antiretroviral delivery by motor scooter in the communities and the fact that nurses were giving antiretroviral therapy in communities for people who could afford it, it was clear and just hit me immediately, you know, we, we, they, we could do antiretroviral therapy in Africa. We don't have to settle for just nevirapine. Tony completely agreed and got hyper excited. That's the ask then. If, if George Bush has basically got this attitude, which I, yeah. which I love, that says, don't come to me asking for money. Come to me and tell me what you can do and what impact it's going to have. And then later we'll figure out how much it costs. Your plan was we need to get antiretroviral drugs to people as, as cheaply as possible and this is the plan to do it. You had a specific plan related to delivery via motorbikes, basically? Yeah, it was more complex than that. And, and I need to be clear, it was a very loose plan because um, no one had ever done anything like this. And there were no data. There weren't a lot of data to back it up. And so the idea was basically, and this is how all health systems function, including the United States. It's basically a, a hub and spoke. 
Uh, so you have a center and then you have further and further, you get further and further out into the community, ultimately doing things like motor scooters to homes in rural villages. But you can start in, in, in you know, large university or other hospitals, public hospitals in the, in the cities, clinics in the cities, and then you spread out. But you, you have a training system that, that allows you to get the, that to get down to the to a community quickly. I don't think many people think about this who are American or who live in the rich world simply because we have really well functioning healthcare systems and you know well let's really well functioning for you know by some standards let's say yeah, by, by, for certain by, people um for certain people but certainly compared to the other places in the world to, to Africa our healthcare systems function really well and for the most part you don't have to think very hard you just go find a doctor and certain maybe you pay too much but you know the 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 allocation of care doesn't require a lot of logistics that like the everyday person has to think of no but like in you know it, in some places you actually you know it's a real, real challenge. How are we going to get drugs out to these villages that are not connected to, you know, sometimes electricity, sometimes much of, you know, the, the country's modern infrastructure? Like that's, a, it seems like a much bigger logistical challenge in Africa that, that people here never have to think about. That's true. People here don't have to think about it. someone had to at the beginning and someone still does um, uh, for various things. So if you get if you have diagnosed with cancer from your primary doctor in a rural community, you're going to go to a university or some other hospital for further testing. And then you're going to come up, you're going to have specialists who give you a drug regimen and and doctors and communities are educated or go to courses that are led by people in from universities and others so that they stay up to date. So we have a version of it, but you're quite right. There were no supply. This is what is astounding about and, and why HIV has fundamentally changed the healthcare system in Africa and other places is you needed to create a system for daily therapy, um, uh, which includes clinical medical personnel. Um, it includes community healthcare workers, a lot of them. It includes supply chains, logistic systems, information systems, none of which really existed for day-to-day therapy, which is why the bulk of the public health community said it was impossible and it shouldn't even be tried, which is appalling when you think back on it. And it literally in 2001, 2002, people, the majority of public health people were saying, don't even try antiretroviral therapy in Africa. And that's why there was no Millennium Development Goal for antiretroviral therapy, because people stood on the floor of the General Assembly and said, people are too, Africans are too uneducated and don't have the systems to possibly do something as complicated as antiretroviral therapy. So it should not even be tried. The most we should do is just provide prevention. And people, leaders in public health were saying this um, quite vocally. Uh, And behind it was, of course, a nascent racism. And behind it was a nascent, don't take a risk on resistance to antiretrovirals starting over there that could come and hurt us. Uh, It was a really horrible thing. And we kind of went through some similar stuff during COVID. Um, We didn't question whether or not they could do it. We just didn't help them (laughs) or support them. But it was a massive deal. And it was a uh, it was a massive act by the president of the United States to say, without a lot of data, without a lot of information, I think we can do this. I have confidence we can do this. Uh, I have confidence in the African people that they can do this most importantly, because they're the ones who are going to have to do it. That's the difference between pilot projects and national scale up. And that's remarkable trust and vision and belief in others. And I think a lot of it had to do with, you know, I, President Bush doesn't get viscerally upset about much, but when people would start talking about Africans or other people as, you know, that they couldn't do something simply because they were, didn't have resources, would he would get so angry mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. that they, they're just as smart, they're just as intelli- in, in, have as much ingenuity. They just need support. Um, the fact that they're black and live in Africa doesn't change anything other than we should, we should support them more. I think it's such an interesting story because, you know, when you think about the story of medicine and and how human progress moves forward, a lot of this is obviously the development of the drug. The development of antiretroviral drugs is 
wildly important and yep. whoever all the people who contributed to it should all win a thousand Nobel prizes each but you know more than just the medicine you also need that uh, whether you want to call it the energy the capacity the this sometimes we we talk about state capacity on this podcast and and certainly state capacity is something african states and governments need more of but you need that kind of whether you could call it creativity or just management, like you don't think of bureaucracy as being a creative field, but you need energy and creativity and drive to make things happen there because we had the drugs. And the real question, the real stumbling block was how do we solve the logistical bureaucratic problems in places where, just being very honest, African states are not always known for good governance. They're not known for having strong state capacity. How do we make this happen then? Well, but before you got there, you had to have the values and compassion to want to do it. So by the time President Bush did, you know, put forward PEPFAR, the United, people in the United States and Europe, have, people, almost everyone had access to antiretrovirals. Not everyone, but almost everyone did uh, who were HIV positive. And we were doing it and there was no problem, but no one was thinking, oh, we should also be giving it to Africa. And again, the public health community was saying it's not possible. So the creativity uh, comes after the value to say we, need, we should do this. Then the second thing is, can we do it? How do we do it? And, but you have to have the should we do it first. And that value, those values are hugely important. And that's what separates the United States or has traditionally separate the United States from other global powers, especially those we're competing with now, that we have that value, or we did. I hope we continue with it. So it was the value and then the ingenuity, the creativity, and the, the desire to work with others to achieve. You know, logistics are at the backbone of all success. You know, any general will tell you logistics are the most important things. You have to set up the systems, but you have to believe they can set, people can set up systems and you have to invest in their capacity. So you have to put that all together. But, I, you know, when really looking back on it, yep, I was on a panel with Josh Bolton <laughs> celebrating the 15th year of PEPFAR. We're now at the 20th and let's hope we get to the 25th because right now Congress is refusing to reauthorize uh, PEPFAR for another five years, which is astounding and will be absolutely destroy our diplomatic standing in Africa and a lot of the rest of the world, but also is just almost unconscionable. But when, on the 15th anniversary, Josh and I were on a panel, and one of the questions that was asked of us by Liz Schreyer from USGLC, who was hosting it, was, what surprised you the most about PEPFAR? And my answer was that it worked. <laughs> And Josh <laughs> poked his head out from the panel and looked over at me like, what? <laughs> you were some, you know, we didn't, there wasn't, there, there was no roadmap here. There was no, this is how you're going to go do it. We, you could do vaccines, but that's very different than daily antiretroviral therapy. There was no good costing. We did bottom up costing based on data we got from the clinics that I told you about in Africa on what it was actually costing them to run those sites because there were no good estimates on what it would cost to do something like this because no one had ever done it. So we got bottom up costing, which is how we got to the $15 billion, which was a third of what, what was needed, but it was bottom up costing, but you know, you had to have the, you had to have the, the value, the confidence, the creativity and the energy, as you said, to do something that no one else had done before. And that takes a lot. That's not easy to do in anyone's life. And what Pe PEPFAR was a startup in the U.S. government. I mean, it was functionally a startup company in the U.S. government. I'd love to get into that a little bit more in terms of, you know, it's not easy to do in terms of having a startup in the U.S. government. You had a great interview with uh, Statecraft recently, uh, which is made from the guys at the Institute for Progress. And, and we love IFP. They're good guys over there. But one of the interesting things I noticed in that Statecraft interview was talking a lot about how you navigate the bureaucracy within the U.S. government, that there's interagency fights sometimes, different people want to control money, different people want a voice at the table. How do you kind of navigate all that? What's your experience of trying to take a, a giant pile of money at this point 
and actually get it to the places where it needs to go and not let kind of the bureaucracy do its thing and just make this a slow mess of a process? Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I often joke that if I knew then what I knew now, what I know now about the U.S. government, I never would have thought PEPFAR was possible either. That's not true. The vast majority of people go into government, just think about it, go into government because they want to make a difference. They're not going in because they want to have political fights about the, you know, whether or not they control X, Y, or Z budget. If they want that, they can go into the private sector. I mean, the, this notion that the government is the only place that has this, go, go into any big company <laughs> or small company. And you'll, have just as, you'll have the same politics, you'll have the same you know, people trying to protect what's theirs. It's no different uh, anywhere in my experience, including small NGOs to you know, massive corporations and the U.S., everything in between. It's because it's human beings running them. But the U.S. government is particularly large and has lots of agencies, and you have to manage all of that. And But people go wanting to do something. And so if they have the opportunity to do something big and make a difference, they'll jump at it because that's why they went there in the first place. And they'll put aside those things that they spend their days doing in the absence of the ability to do something great. So all you have to do is tap into that. But the reality is to tap into that, to get to that point, you have to have the leadership. And in this case, you need the lead. And this is true in most countries. You need the leadership of the president. So we counted when PEPFAR was announced, um, there were about 77 presidential initiatives. Um, I don't think the president knew about more than three of them. Uh, but this was very personal to the president. <laughs> that is true. There's, yeah. there's always like, you know, president's commission on, yeah. on potato salad or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And just look at the number of things that are announced in the State of the Union that never go anywhere. So, you know, the president took very personal interest in this and the people close around him, most importantly, Josh Bolton. Andy Card, who was chief of staff at the time, deferred to Josh. Andy did what he needed to do. Um, but, but Josh was the point person as deputy chief of staff, and he had a great team around him. Uh, and Josh is really the angel of PEPFAR, but as deputy chief of staff, then he went on to direct the Office of Management and Budget, and then he was chief of staff. And in each position, when something needed to be done, uh, Josh made sure it got done. The president did in the end, but the president, you know, can't be busy day to day worrying about such things, nor can Josh. But everyone in the U.S. government knew that the U.S. Global AIDS coordinator, who's an assistant secretary of state level, had direct access to the president of the United States. And they knew that because uh, they would act on it, that if something was needed, the White House would deliver. And when, with that knowledge, even secretaries, um, four-star generals, uh, um, people involved would defer to an assistant secretary of state because it was clear that the president wanted that something done. Um, and that made all the difference in the world. You don't need that now um, because it's now part of the, the system, part of the bureaucracy, but you needed it then. Just let me give you an example. The State Department would not give us permanent positions. Every position we had was on loan <laughs> because they said in five years, this isn't going to exist anymore. So we're not giving you any slots, any of our government slots. That's all changed now. Now it's, you know, now, now PEPFAR is part of the State Department. Actually, the head of PEPFAR leads the Bureau of Pandemic Preparedness and Response, John Kangasong, and he's exactly the right person for it. But back then it wasn't. And um, so you had to bring all these things forward within the U.S. government and make departments and agencies work together. Even within departments and agencies, people fight all the time. So. Um, that had to happen, but it was doable because of the presidential leadership, because of the bipartisan support in Congress. And that was hugely important, hugely important. But so was how we implemented. And I think this is really important. Um, and this is a lesson that I see a lot of people don't follow and fail in governments and other institutions or private sector because of it. One was, you know, we, we moved on a plan. We had a plan and we executed against it and we didn't get distracted. There were a lot of reasons to get distracted. You know, people were like, well, people need food and water or they can't, you know, take their antivirals. So you should take X hundreds of millions of dollars and 
put it in food and water. So those things are important, but we had to deliver on what we needed to deliver on, which was really important. We had a plan uh, and we scaled it up. So we got attacked pretty vocally <laughs> by a lot of people at the beginning because when they heard $15 billion, they assumed $3 billion a year and the first budget request was one and a half billion. So they said, oh, you're not serious about this. No, we were very serious about it, but you, there was no way to spend $3 billion in the first year because the capacity wasn't there. And we knew that from studying the programs uh, and really any program when you do this, it, you, it's a hockey stick. You have to build capacity. Botswana had done the same thing because they started an anti-retroviral program on their own, the president of the country with um, the Gates Foundation and Merck. So we, we looked at that as well. You, you needed to build capacity. And, and I'd love to really dive deep here. I'd love to get yeah. into this like deeply because this is something I was looking forward to. You know, we referenced earlier the the issue of building capacity that yeah. we've almost lost that a little bit these days and that it seems like there's so many just choke points to getting anything yep. done. But there's it, it's a really vitally important thing. The government can accomplish really, really big things when it you know builds capacity, when it uses its power to make things happen, to build things, to create things. So what was your experience like with the idea of kind of you have to build this capacity to actually get this money out there? Because it, it does seem like a big problem. OK, we've got 15 yep. billion dollars. Are we just going to drop it from helicopters somewhere? Yeah. You know, how yeah. do how do you actually build an agency that can spend fifteen billion dollars efficiently in the way that it needs to be spent? Well, and this is one of the great insights, which was put the coordinator, the person who's going to manage all of this, in the State Department, because the State Department doesn't implement anything and doesn't actually write large grants either. But agencies do. And so by giving the State Department the authority and the money, all the money went to the State Department, but then the State Department and the coordinator under national plans that were created transferred the money to agencies to do the work. And each country had goals by year to achieve. And we had the indicators for them, which again, didn't exist before. What existed before was how much money are you spending? The notion of within, and we did it by six month periods with six month reporting against key indicators, number of people on antiretroviral therapy, number of people screened, number of women receiving mother and child transmission uh, medication, because I was still a key part of it, uh, prevention activity indicators, and they were reported on each six months. And we required that there be one country plan, not one from USAID, one from Defense, one from Health and Human Services or, or, or USA, USAID, CDC, one from the Peace Corps, but one plan and how they all fit together and contributed towards those goals. And then you had to list every single implementing partner and how they were going to contribute to the goals. And we had a strong emphasis on local partners like Tasso that I mentioned in Uganda because they were already on the ground. And that was the advantage the U.S. government had because even though they were small, we had USAID field offices in each of the countries with the exception of Iswatini or Swaziland. And we had the U.S. CDC, smaller focus on epidemiology, but existing in each country. And each of those organizations have massive grant making capacity and we had people on the ground, so all we had to do is supplement that. And we often, at the people who were added on the ground, yes, some of them came from the United States, but a lot of them came from the local environment. A lot of them were local doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, educators, um, bureaucrats, um, or just administrators. And they then grew offices and capacity to increase over time the capacity and uh, in the country. And the, that was the second important piece. It wasn't the U.S. government. It was the people in the country. The countries had to own the plans. They had to, 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 to live and do them because it was all their facilities. It was all their people. It was all their roads. It was all their supply chains. And so you had to build those relationships um, between the U.S. government and the countries. Now, sometimes it was the government and sometimes it was non-government. Sometimes it was both. Uh, often it was both. But there were some countries in which the governments weren't particularly helpful. 
um, and were actually counterproductive. So often you would use more NGOs or non-governmental organizations, faith-based organizations, community-based organizations in those circumstances. But you had to do it a bit at a time. You couldn't start with $3 billion or $5 billion a year. And so the plan went from $1.5 billion a year up to $5 billion a year, um, because that's where you needed to get to if you were going to reach the goals. But you had to build the capacity as you went. And as an example, and this is why people have continued to scale up the number of people in antiretroviral therapy. At the end of the first five years, we knew to get a reauthorization, we would need um, uh, to, to show how much money it costs to put people in treatment at the beginning and then at the end of five years. And we sent health economists out to go clinic by clinic, site by site, to, to do the analyses. And what they found is that in the first six months, it cost $6,000 per person to start antiretroviral therapy. The reason for that is you had to, some, you, you usually had to build or refurbish a clinic. Um, you had to employ staff. You had to get supplies to them. You had to get antiretroviral drugs for the right number of people. And you had to build the community organizations. By the end of the fifth year, we were down to about $600 a person, which has subsequently dropped to $300, $300 a person. But the reason for that is the infrastructure had been built. The people have been put in place. And this really does it, this really does sound like startups. Like you called this a startup yeah. within the US government, but the whole idea of a startup is we build a cool service, like a tech service, a website, some cool platform, and we, we lose a ton of money at the beginning, but it's okay, because once we hit scale, we're gonna get a right. lot of users and everything's gonna be really, really efficient at scale. And this is not that different of a story from that. It's it's different in some ways, but you know it's not. Everything functions this way, right? When you have to build capacity, it's going to cost you more up front. Um, and that's why you need to have patience. And that's why you need to build slowly. If we had asked for $3 billion the first year, which is what the activists wanted, we would have failed. We, PEPFAR would have died in its, in its infancy because we couldn't have spent all that money. And they would have turned to us and been like, Where, what did you do with $3 billion? You got, you got 100,000 people on treatment. Your goal is 2 million. You have five. It's not a linear. It's not linear, but everyone looks at it as linear if you treat it as linear. So we didn't ask for $3 billion the first year. We asked for $1.5 billion. And we used it, and we used it wisely, and then we built the infrastructure, and then we set goals where you would see an increase in people on treatment, which is what people are mostly watching, because it's difficult to measure prevention every six months, or women receiving mother and child transmission. And we had that steady pace going from um, 50,000 the first six months to 2 million at the end, after five years. And people would look at that, including some people in the wild, be like, how are you going to get from 50,000 to 2 million? You know, they were expecting, well, it'd be 100,000 a year. It's not. Uh, uh, I mean, 500,000 a year. It's not. In the last year, a million people are put in treatment because you built the capacity and the infrastructure to do it. And that's how you have to think about it. You can't think about it as li in a linear way when you're building something. You have to think about what you need at the beginning and build off of that. And don't ask for too much money early if you can't spend it because it's just sitting in the bank. And that's what happened to the Millennium Challenge Corporation. They were the darling of Congress. They throw, threw money at, but, but they, couldn't, they didn't spend it. We knew that we had to show results and we had to show results quickly because no one liked the plan. <laughs> The Republicans hated it. The Democrats hated it for different reasons. Um, it was really just the White House that wanted it um, and some of us in the administration, you know, in the, in the civil service. And then the second thing you had to do was be bipartisan and fully informed. The amount of time we spent going up to Capitol Hill, briefing staff uh, on what we were doing, well, how we were doing it why we were doing it the way we were doing it, where we were falling short and what we were doing to correct it because we had real-time reporting and we had on-the-ground people. Uh, that's what made all the difference. And we always did in a bipartisan way. You know, when, in the first years of the Bush administration, Republicans were heavily in charge of all chambers, but we still met with the Democrats all the time in a bipartisan way. Because first of all, it's the smart thing to do because you know they're going to be back in power. And secondly, you need everyone on your side. You need everyone learning and part of it. And so what people often do in the U.S. government is they don't plan for scale up. They, they just you know, ask for as much as they can, thinking that they'll just keep it. 
Uh, and this is true. In, this is not just true in government. It's true in any age organization. It's true in, in the private sector as much as it is in government. The second thing is that they don't educate regularly and admit when you're making a mistake on how you're going to change it and have the reporting to back it up. And third, to talk to everyone, to share information. The in instinct is always keep it to myself, you know, get as much money as you want, as you can early on. Don't think about building, just get as much as you can and control as much as you can and don't tell anyone anything. The number of times I got lectured by other assistant secretaries saying, stop meeting with staff because now they, staff want to meet with me and I want to meet with the members. I'm like, well, who do you think makes all the decisions? Members don't, can't meet with you every other week. You need to be up there every other week, every month telling them what's happening. People in the U.S. government were screaming at me, don't give so much information to Congress because then they'll just ask for more. I'm like, our budget had no earmarks in it. Your, your, your budget's earmarked to death because you're not telling them anything. If you don't tell them anything, they're going to assume you don't know what you're doing. Plus, you tell them everything's going fine. And if you keep telling every, everyone everything's going fine when it's clear it's not, you don't have a lot of credibility. So, you know, scale, plan for scale, plan carefully for scale. Only ask for as much money as you think you're going to need. And keep people informed and adapt, constantly change. And that's one of the reasons we succeeded because we had multiple agencies and we controlled the pot of money and we had very clear goals and we knew who was doing what and people had to report. And so if countries or subgroups weren't, weren't meeting up to where they were, we moved money to places that were. So you were, no one in the US, it was the first time I think people just weren't guaranteed money because they were told they were going to get it. We shifted money from year to year, from country to country, to from program to program, based on who was performing and who wasn't. And that's quite an incentive to change your practices. I think that description of how you tried to keep Congress informed is really, really interesting because we are at a moment now where the, the PEPFAR program is once again kind of up for reauthorization. And it, it, I think it actually has passed its limit now. It's, it's missed the deadline for reauthorization. And yeah. we, we, it still could be reauthorized. But right now, the program is in limbo for the first time in a long time. And it seems to me that you know there, this has become subject to some level of partisan bickering. As, as best I understand it, the Republican side wants abortion-related provisions in there. The Democrats are very, very unhappy with that. They say, we're not going to go with that. And they're kind of now just at a standoff. As someone with experience on Capitol Hill explaining these programs, how would you try to kind of help people work through this? Because whatever happens, regardless of political squabbling, like it seems very clear to me, we need this program to continue. It is an intensely valuable program. How would you try to navigate the crisis that the program is in right now? So first, you know, we've had for author reauthorization, the first in 2008. That was the only one, uh, and I, President Bush led that effort, and I worked very hard on it. Um, that was the only time we had a full piece of le reauthorizing legislation. Since then, the reauthorizations have basically just been changing the dates and numbers from the 2008 reauthorization. And the reason that's been done is because there's been an understanding that each side has given up and, you know, it was five years of negotiating year by year that each side in two, by 2008 had, had gotten to a negotiated position of, we'll put up with this if you put up with that. And we understand that if we challenge any of this kind of grand deal, the whole thing's going to fall apart quickly because I'll ask, I'll demand this when I'm in power and then you'll demand that when you're in power and then the whole thing falls apart. And that's kind of where we are right now. First of all, it's not... I wouldn't characterize as Democrats and Republicans. I'd characterize as certain people within the, the Republican Party, some of whom are quite well-intentioned, who have been very strongly pro-life their entire lives. Uh, men have always wanted a certain provision called Mexico City applied to PEPFAR. Mexico City is, is in addition to the existing law. There are existing laws that forbid any U.S. government funds from being used to fund abortion in another country, so not a penny of the U.S. government money has ever been used for abortion in any program because it's illegal um, by a different law. And it's also illegal for 
U.S. contractors and grantees to advocate for policy change in a government, um, a foreign government that's against the law. You know, the laws have always been there around the abortion issue. What's happened is people who are who are angry or think the Biden administration is being too pro abortion globally and domestically have decided to use PEPFAR as a kicking ball. And then um, facts have become secondary. Now, again, there are very well-intentioned people here um, who are, but because of our, the current vitriol in our system and because of the way people get information, which is not you know, always factual, but through different systems. Uh, and once you have that information, it's really tough to, to knock it out. A lot of well-intentioned people have have accepted on face value the misinformed or intentionally uh, misinformed information from from groups that they've worked with for a long time or people that they've worked with for with a long time. They've taken it on face value, even though it's factually incorrect, and we can't get past that right now. Um, and that's led to people who have supported PEPFAR for a long time and organizations, uh, e- e- pro-life people who are now this time saying, no, we have to go further on abortion, even though it, it, it factually it makes no sense at all. Um, but I understand where they're coming from. It's just the nature of the current circumstance. There are plenty of Republicans who understand the value of PEPFAR. There are plenty of Republicans on the national security side who see the massive diplomat. Imagine the U.S. government doesn't reauthorize PEPFAR for five years. What do you think the African people are going to think our commitment to them is? While we're fighting pretty hard for um, who influence in, in, in Africa with China and Russia, um, as we've seen with recent com- countries like Niger, Burkina Faso falling because of misinformation campaigns from Russia uh, and troops stationed there. China's all over the continent. Imagine what the African reaction is going to be when we stop the only thing that you know we're doing massively in Africa, and that is keep that has twenty is supporting twenty million people in Africa on antiretroviral therapy. And right now we're saying it's our values that you it's our values that you should be going with, not China and Russia. What yeah. do you think it's going to tell them about our values if we can't reauthorize this over total misinformation? I mean, literally, yeah. when you talk to people around the world, they're like, what is going on? What is wrong? Do you have any <laughs> they, idea? They, they say that about a lot of things going on in the U.S. Yeah. government. So, but no, I mean, look, I, I'm not going to I'm not going to solve the, the pro-life versus pro-choice conflict. That is that is not something that you and I can figure out in the nope. next five minutes of a podcast conversation. The only thing I will say is that it, it will be a real shame if someone's pro-life convictions stop them from authorizing this program that is clearly a pro-life life-saving program like it, it is the most pro-life program the united states probably has ever engaged in mm-hmm. um and oddly enough and evangelicals have been involved in this program for a long time i've been clear about this before this debate no one in africa and rural villages and faith communities were talking about abortion now they're all talking about abortion um because of this debate if 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 it, any of these claims were true, the the large number of faith communities, the the tribal leaders, the people who are involved in the communities would be out would be shouting from the rooftops that someone promoting abortion because most in, abortion is illegal in all but four countries in Africa. So the notion that there's a slush fund for abortion, how could that be? There are four countries in Africa with legalized abortion. And they're talking about three organizations who are minor subsets of the resources in those countries. So where where does that slush come from? It's not even a drop. Um, and then you have the fact that it's completely illegal for a U.S. organization to engage in any way, shape or form, not only in providing abortion care, but in advocating for it because it's against the law to do any advocacy in countries. Um, so th- this is all n- nonsense, um, but it it's being promoted um, in a way that is very aggressive and dangerous in ways that hasn't in the past. And there's so much fear um, now that even people who know it's wrong are afraid to stand up and say it's wrong. We're coming up on time now. 
So I want to ask the traditional final question that we always ask at the end of this podcast, and that is, where can people go to learn more? If they're interested in what we're talking about here, if they're interested in the fight against AIDS and other infectious diseases even, perhaps, if they're interested in the history of PEPFAR and how we fund things, if they're interested in building bureaucracy and making bureaucracy work better and all the things we've been talking about here, what would you recommend? This could be a book to read. This could be a publication. This could be someone who's good to follow on Twitter. Just any source of information for people who are interested in this and want to continue to dive in. Yeah, so I would follow the U.S. State Department, PEPFAR.gov. Um, there's an organization called the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria I mentioned. I would follow their website because they have a more of a global region that follows malaria and TB as well. And then there's something called Friends of the Fight, which I'm on the board of, that has a website too that is very involved in the advocacy as well as Bono's organization, One. Uh, and they have a whole section about you know what's happening not only programmatically but politically. Kaiser Family Foundation also does a great job. So there are there, once you get connected to one of them, they all refer to each other, and there are podcasts all over on each of them that deals with these really important issues. Uh, UNAIDS also has has a website if people are interested in that. I, I'm not on any social media, um, so and there's very little written about the the, the origins of PEPFAR. John Donnelly did a piece in um, health affairs a long time ago, but the Bush administration, uh, the Bush Institute, the George W. Bush Institute actually has the oral history of the origins of PEPFAR. You know, every president has oral histories and PEPFAR was one of them. And there are a couple of people, Josh Bolton, Mike Gerson, uh, uh, myself, Tony Fauci, who were interviewed and they've they they've curated the the oral histories and it's on the george w bush institute website www.gwbi i think.com i should know since i was the first health fellow there um, but there's not a lot on on the history of pepfar and um which is kind of sad most people don't know about it and it's unfortunate because it's one of the great acts of of mercy as the president called it uh it's one of the great actions of humankind, really, and more sh people should know about it. Well, I hope we can contribute to that just a little bit in our own way. I, I want to thank you again for coming on the show, Dr. Mark Dybel. Thank you.